All right. How are you guys doing this morning? Eddie, Eddie, you're too chatty. Come on, buddy. Let's go. That's enough. Time's up. <laughs> no, it's great. It's great that uh, you guys have the opportunity to mix and mingle. Um, hopefully, this is not the only time you connect with your church family, um, because honestly, it's not enough. If this is the only time you connect with your church family, it's not enough. Hopefully, uh, you're involved in a small group or you get together with people during the week. Hey, just take somebody out to lunch, you know. Um, but uh, we need encouragement from one another. You know, Proverbs talks about how iron sharpens iron and, um, uh, and one man sharpens another in the same way. So um, please make a point to connect with your church family more than just Sunday morning. Um, is a corny, a corny old church sign that said, seven days without church makes one week, right? Yeah, so um, if you go the whole week and that's the only time that you get together, it's not enough to sustain you, all right? So, um, well, we're going to dig in today. Um, I've got uh, a little bit of, a little bit of uh, scripture to share with you this morning, and uh, hopefully you will um, follow me on this journey. We'll go in and, and do this little adventure together. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about my first girlfriend. Um, my wife is not in here, so I decided I would go ahead and just get this out of the way real quick before she comes back. Uh, my first girlfriend in high school was amazing, all right, amazing. Uh, what? I don't, I don't understand. Just listen. I took her out to nice restaurants. Uh, I bought her things all the time. I sent her flowers. I wrote her long letters and notes. I wore things that I'm embarrassed to admit to you today. There it is. I actually dug this one out of the archives. Um, just, just take a second and just drink that in. Um, yeah. Uh, the hair, you know, the white tuck, the white shoes, the pink, pastel pink. Oh, oh my goodness. Um, some things that just really should never have been ever, ever done um, in the name, of, in the name of, of love. Well, I was so enamored with the idea of being cared for by a girl like I just wanted to have a girlfriend you know I have all these friends they have girlfriends I didn't have one I finally have a girlfriend I'm like yes so I'm doing all of the things right you know um, and and I just I was so excited about it I, I was so excited though that I missed a few little details um, one of these tiny tidbits was the fact that my amazing girlfriend had rekindled her romance with her ex-boyfriend um, and she was with him for nine of the ten months that we dated. It's <laughs> pretty good. Awesome, right? <laughs> she was awesome. Um, so now you understand my statement in the beginning. It's, it's not a threat. Uh, there is no concern about that at all. Um, I certainly don't feel that way about her now. At the time, yes. So have you ever been there? Uh, have you contracted an acute case of love blindness? Uh, maybe it wasn't love, maybe it was something else, and you're just so like, oh, I can't believe this is actually happening to me, that you miss out on some, some things. Um, I wasn't in love with this girl, as it turned out. Uh, I was in love with the idea of being in love. Obviously, I wasn't really blind, not literally blind, uh, but it caused me to miss a lot that I would never ignore again. And so when I found Carla... Um, I actually knew on the night we went out the very first time I told my roommate I could marry this girl and and I knew right away because I already knew what I didn't want and I already knew uh, what I wanted and she was pretty much just perfect like God just wrapped her and delivered her <coughs> so uh, so you'll have to tell her I said lots of bad things whenever you see her um, but uh, maybe you can relate better to the Febreze commercials like this one Yep, you've gone nose blind. You think it smells fine, but others smell this. Use new Febreze Fabric Refresher for your hard-to-wash fabrics. Its odor clear technology cleans away sweaty odors and leaves a light, fresh scent. So maybe, I don't know, maybe that's something that resonates with you a little bit more. Uh, you don't really notice maybe some of the awful things that you have in your home. Uh, you've maybe visited somebody else's home and you were like, oh, wow. Uh, and they don't even notice because they're so used to it, right? 
Um, and so sometimes we do become blind to things. Um, so we get a little closer, a little close to our own reality, and sometimes we miss uh, and, and don't have our focus where it needs to be on the bigger picture. Well, Ferris Bueller, uh, some of you may remember him, uh, from the iconic 80s film, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, uh, he said, life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop to look around once in a while, you could miss it. Uh, that's clever wisdom from filmmaker, from filmmaker John Hughes, but if you read much of the Bible, you realize there's so much more than just this life. So much more. Open your eyes or you'll miss God's power. Open your eyes or you'll miss God's power. Now, if we miss God's power, we may start to doubt and become weak. We need our faith refueled by seeing him keep his promises. We recharge our spiritual batteries by seeing him work in our lives and in the lives of others. And that's one of the reasons why I said what I said when we started this. We need to see God working. Sometimes God's working in our lives. Some God, sometimes God's working in other people's lives. Sometimes God is using you to work in someone else's life. And we need to see this to recharge our faith batteries. Um, our faith is renewed and strengthened when we witness his power. It is so important that we stay connected to that. So we're going to look today at an account of when a prophet of God named Elisha and his servant were surrounded by the enemies of Israel. We're going to pay close attention here to what God is doing here. Um, so if you'll turn your Bible to 2 Kings chapter 6, it's a, a, a bit of a lengthy passage today, 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 8 through 23. 2 Kings 6, 8 through 23. When the king of Aram was at war with Israel, he would confer with his officers and say, we will mobilize our forces at such and such a place. But immediately, Elisha, the man of God, would warn the king of Israel, do not go near that place, for the Arameans are planning to mobilize their troops there. So the king of Israel would send word to the place indicated by the man of God. Time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he would be on alert there. The king of Aram became very upset over this. He called his officers together and demanded, which of you is the traitor? Who has been informing the king of Israel of my plans? It's not us, my lord the king, one of the officers replied. Elisha, the prophet in Israel, tells the king of Israel even the words you speak in the privacy of your bedroom. Go and find out where he is, the king commanded, so I can send troops to seize him. And the report came back, Elisha is at Dothan. So one night, the king of Aram sent a great army with many chariots and horses to surround the city. When the servant of the man of God got up early the next morning and went outside, there were troops, horses, and chariots everywhere. Oh, sir, what will we do now? The young man cried to Elisha. Don't be afraid, Elisha told him, for there are more on our side than on theirs. Then Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes, and when he looked up, he saw that the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. As the Aramean army advanced toward him, Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, please make them blind. So the Lord struck them with blindness, as Elisha had asked. Then Elisha went out and told them, you have come the wrong way. This isn't the right city. Follow me, and I will take you to the man you are looking for. And he led them to the city of Samaria. As soon as they had entered Samaria, Elisha prayed, O Lord, now open their eyes and let them see. So the Lord opened their eyes, and they discovered that they were in the middle of Samaria. When the king of Israel saw them, he shouted to Elisha, My father, should I kill them? Should I? Should I kill them? Of course not, Elisha replied. Do we kill prisoners of war? Give them food and drink and send them home again to their master. So the king made a great feast for them and sent them home to their master. After that, the Aramean raiders stayed away from the land of Israel. So what is God doing here? 
I'm going to show you six truths God wants you to see about his power right here in this scripture. Now, don't get scared. You heard me say six. That wasn't, you didn't, you didn't hear that wrong. I said six. It's not going to be that long, so just bear with me. The first one that I want you to look at today about God's power is that God's power is protective. God was already protecting Israel. Every time the Aramean king planned a military advance, God told Elisha, and Elisha told the king of Israel. Aram's plans were thwarted again and again, and maybe we're being protected by God, but we don't give him credit. I don't know that anybody was giving God credit here, all right? Elisha was the only one seeing it. Um, But God was protecting Israel, and God sometimes protects us, and I think probably more often than we even realize. We're quick to ask where God is or why he's ignoring us when things aren't going well, aren't we? But the truth is that sometimes, maybe many times, God is working and protecting us from painful outcomes. We have to stop whining and open our eyes. In my house, especially when Savannah was little, we had a rule, and every time uh, she would start to get a little, then we would say, Savannah, what's the rule? And she would say, no, you know, and she'd have to say it again until she said it without actual whining. Um, So we need to stop whining. We need to open our eyes and pay attention. I know it's old and cliche, all right, but I love it. The Footprints poem is a great illustration of this. Maybe you haven't read the Footprints poem. I'm going to spare you because you probably have. Um, if you haven't, go home and read it this afternoon. But, um, the, but it's a great illustration. Um, the unknown writer talks about a walk on a beach with God. They leave two sets of footprints in the sand behind them. And looking back, the tracks represent various stages of the writer's life. And at various points, the two trails dwindle so that there's just one, especially at the lowest times and, and most hopeless moments of the person's life. When questioning God, believing that the Lord must have, had, must have abandoned his love during those times, God gives this explanation. During your times of trial and suffering, when you see only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. And even though we suffer in this life, I'm confident that without the protection of God, the suffering would be much more. There are times when you are suffering and you're blaming God and you're frustrated with God, but it's actually the fact that God has protected you from even worse suffering. And we can't know that. We can't know that except that we know that God loves us. And I am confident that God does spare us a lot of times from things that are even worse than what we're going through. Not only is God's power protective, but his power is ready. When Aram tried to stop Elisha, the king did not understand that it was the power of God stopping him. So he didn't respect the power. Ever assume you know what's happening only to find out later that you were way wrong? I'll never forget the time we took Canyon to the doctor. Um, He was about three three years old, maybe a little younger than that. He'd been sick for a while, and it seemed like he wasn't going to get better without some outside help. Um, We are not the type of people that rush to the doctor, um, but it seemed like, okay, he's he's not getting better. Um, He never really complained about it much, but we did start to notice him, you know, rubbing his ear, all right? Uh, The doctor checked him out, and he informed us that he had an ear infection and a ruptured an almost ruptured eardrum. It was right on the verge of rupturing. Talk about feeling like a horrible parent. Um, He looked at us like we were pure evil and uh, immediately made us feel that way. Uh, So we had no idea it was so serious. Obviously, if we did, we would have been there sooner. Um, So we were very nonchalant about it. We thought we knew what was wrong with our kid. Ah, He just has a cold. You know, there's nothing to worry about. Uh, But obviously, we didn't. And the king thought he knew what was going on with Elisha, too. But he didn't have a clue. God's power is waiting and ready to be used, just like the aquifer that runs under the ground that you're standing on. Well, I guess you're sitting right now. Um, But everywhere we walk, there's all this power underneath us, 
right? And it's kind of, actually, we forget about it, uh, but it's kind of amazing when you think about it. All you have to do is drill a well. I mean, you have to drill pretty far to get to it. You have to, you know, you have to mean it. You're not going to accidentally just poke a hole in it with your shovel. But you've got, as soon as you drill a hole, as soon as you drill a well, you've got fresh water. Um, and that's the way God's power is. The, the Arameans, they had no idea about the incredible power that was just surging and waiting to be tapped into. God's power is ready. God's power is also unlimited. Elisha's servant was afraid when he saw the army surrounding them. He didn't trust God to keep protecting them. When you trust our God, who has no limits, you, your trust shouldn't have limits either. When we put constraints on God that don't come from him, we can miss out on some really big things. All right, let's look at uh, the book of Matthew, chapter 19, verses 23 through 26. Matthew 19, 23 through 26. Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it is very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. I'll say it again, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astounded. Then who in the world can be saved, they asked. Jesus looked at them intently and said, humanly speaking, it's impossible. But with God, everything is possible. How often do we hold back? How often do we, uh, do we look at our own abilities and limit what God can do through us or with us or for us? Because we have in our minds, this is, this is the, the box, this is the, uh, the limit of where things can go. This is, this is all that can happen because this is what we've experienced, this is what we've seen, and logically this is what makes sense. But God doesn't live in a box. We actually live in a box. <laughs> um, the world that's been created, that we live in, uh, the, this universe is something that God made. And when you start to think about that, like this is like a sandbox to a child, you know, in, 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 perspective, in God's perspective. Um, this universe that we live in is so vast and, and all these rules are in place and things happen a certain way. But you know what? God made all of it. You know, if he wanted to just turn it upside down and dump it out, he could. We're glad that he doesn't. Uh, but God has the power to do that. He has the power to do anything he wants. And we can't forget that. We can't forget that God doesn't have those limits. We want to put those limits on God and, and restrain him and say, you know, I, I don't, God can't really do this. He can't really, um, he can't really allow me to, to operate this way. But God can do anything and everything. We want him to be something our feeble minds can manage. And I think that's probably the, the reason that we limit God. We want to be able to, to control the image we have of him in our minds. But we can't let that be the limit. We can't. Um, we limit the power that we get to access from him. Have you ever rented a moving truck that had a governor on it and you, uh, you can't go faster than whatever it is, 55, 60, whatever, whatever uh, the company decides, they don't want you exceeding? Um, it's so frustrating because, you know, this vehicle is capable of doing more, you know, but you can't. You have this limit on there and it's, it's, uh, it's frustrating. Um, and that's what we're doing to God when we think small. What can God accomplish when we act in faith? How about starting a ministry that, um, that gives people a chance to be rehabilitated so that they have a better shot at life? Um, what about the guy that you work with finally deciding that he needs to give his life to Jesus? And you think, oh, there's no way he's ever going to do that. How about a habit that you've been trying to quit by your own power for the last 10 years? Are any of these things too big for our God to handle? Absolutely not. God is, is infinitely powerful. His power is unlimited. No, no thing that we can come up with. Our imagination cannot contemplate something that God can't do. But God's power is also inspiring. 
Once Elisha prayed and the servant saw the power of God, he was no longer afraid. We need fuel for our faith. And when we see real evidence of God working, it makes it possible for us to stretch our faith and to knock down God-shrinking barriers. Do you ever hear yourself saying things like these? I'm not smart enough. I'm not talented enough. I don't know enough about the Bible. One person couldn't do all of this. This is way too expensive. Or how can I ever get enough people together to pull this off? Let's think about Moses for a minute. God called him to lead his people out of Egypt, which was a super scary mission. Moses had a whole lineup of excuses ready to go for why he couldn't do it and why it wouldn't work. I'm not good enough. I don't have all the answers. People won't believe me. I'm a terrible public speaker. I'm not qualified. Or, please, anyone but me. And if that had been the end of it, Moses wouldn't have been able to usher in the ten plagues to Pharaoh. He wouldn't have been able to part the Red Sea. He wouldn't have been able to, to bring the stone tablets down the mountain that had the, tan, the Ten Commandments on them. To be the one chosen to introduce the power of God to the world is truly staggering. And once we tap into that unlimited power, there is no stopping us. It's important for us to see evidence of the things we believe so we can be encouraged and brave. God wants us to continue stretching our faith so his kingdom continues to grow. It's a never-ending process, so let his power inspire you and give you courage. Don't make excuses. Say yes. Practice it with me. Yes. All right, one, two, three. Yes. All right, see how easy that is? Just keep that going. Nice, I like it. God's power is inspiring. And when we stop and we say no to him and we cross our arms and say, oh, I don't want to, you know, mm -mm. we allow God's power to work in us and it's going to inspire us to believe in him even more. God's power is also effective. Once Elisha prayed and the Arameans were blinded or dazzled, as might be a better uh, better understanding of that, um, they lost their focus on their primary mission. They lost their focus on their primary mission. Um, We give sinful or selfish things a lot of attention, but if we allow ourselves to marvel at God's wonders, those things are quickly put in their place. Do you want to feel more in control of yourself and of your desires? I'm sure you do, all right? I think we all probably do. Start looking for how God is working in your life, and the Holy Spirit will start to take back those areas of spiritual weakness. It's hard to be angry with your spouse when you're thinking about what God is doing in their life. It's hard to look at pornography when you're focused on how God has been bringing improvements in your marriage. It's hard to spread a rumor when you see how God has been strengthening your friendships at school. Take a look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Ephesians 3, verse 20. Now all glory to God, who is able, through his mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. And I told you that God was able to do anything you can think of. That's not all. You can't even think of all the things that God can do, right? You can't even think of it all. He is infinitely powerful. His power is, well, powerful. We get so comfortable with our cars, don't we? You probably, almost all of you got in a car today and you traveled down here, you parked it in the lot and you walked inside. And you probably didn't even think about the fact that this giant thousands of pound hunk of metal is actually uh, a very deadly uh, thing that you're driving around. Um, it, It has the potential to destroy buildings. It's powered by a substance that explodes. Haven't thought about that in a while. Uh, It's controlled by a steering system and a braking system that, um, you know, they have fluids pumping through, and if those fluids are gone, it could fail at any time. The braking and the steering could fail at any time. But you didn't think about that on your way here, right? You took that for granted a little bit. Um, 
If you're like me, you don't think twice about hopping in your ballistic missile when you leave the house in the morning. It is just as easy to forget how powerful God is. And we take him for granted and we put him in our pocket and we say, God, come on with me to work. I'll show you some things, right? We forget how infinitely powerful God is. He is our God, but he is also our father. He is also our friend, all right? But he is infinitely powerful. God's power is effective. It just works. But his power is also secure. This is the last one. His power is secure. Once Elisha prayed and the Arameans could see clearly again, God's people had overtaken them. They were standing in the middle of this army, and they were completely surrounded, and they're like, how did we get here? Once they could see God, he chose them his mercy instead of the wrath that they deserved. Did you think that the Israelites were going to strike them down when you were listening to the story? Maybe you thought that was coming next. And the king even asked Elisha, what should I do? Should I kill them? And he's like, no. Prisoners of war, feed them, send them home, you know, take them to the movies. I don't know if they did that. How cool is it to be in the middle of turmoil and pain and suddenly you realize that you're safe in the arms of God? I know some of you have experienced that. I bet some of you haven't. The difference is trust. The difference is putting your faith in him and putting your faith in that power to deliver you. He doesn't want you to suffer. He doesn't. We like, to, we like to quickly point fingers at God and say, God, why would you allow this? He's not doing this because he wants you to suffer. He doesn't want you to suffer, just like you don't want your own children to suffer. You don't want your close friends or family to suffer. You don't want that, and God doesn't want that for you either. He's working all the time to minimize your suffering. What a relief to not get what we deserve. Open your eyes or you'll miss God's power. The worship team can make their way up to the stage. God's power is always available to us. And sometimes we don't even realize that we're experiencing it. Don't even realize it. Just completely miss it. It's always on and it's truly unlimited, not like your cellular plan, right? Why would we want to, why would we want to miss out on that? Why wouldn't we want to benefit from that? If you're a follower of Christ, you just need to step out in faith in the next thing that God's calling you to do. It's like the difference between riding a bicycle or driving a car. Use his power to propel you forward, right? If you've got the car available, you don't really ride your bicycle to go to the grocery store. You use the car, right? You have this more power is available to you. Why wouldn't you use it? Um, other than just maybe getting some exercise, but that's silly. Um, if you have more power available to you, you've got to tap into it. Use his power to push you forward. If you're not a follower of Jesus yet, just look at what you're missing. All you need to do to get started on this journey is to trust God with your life. Hand him the keys. He'll show you a better way to live, a peaceful way, a more satisfying way. This power is just waiting to change your life. Open your eyes or you'll miss God's power. Don't be like the Aramean army. Don't be like Elisha's servant. Look up and see what God is doing all around you and be a part of it. Let's pray.